Okie dokie. We are back in 1 John. 1 John part 6. About to blow my nose a hundred times. My allergies are, that yellow top is right on. So, mm -hmm. uh, We'll be in 1 John chapter 4. You know, John's been fighting this heresy, uh, these contradicting ideas, and, and then he's introducing the truth about Jesus, that he is who he says he is. He did come to the flesh, and he is the Son of God. And this, there's this thing that's been coming on along, the distinction between love and hate, and saved and lost, and light and darkness. First John continues that theme. And remember, he wrote these things as a letter, not chapters and verses. It was a letter. So uh, he says here, First John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because there's many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now this is not talking about evil spirits floating around through the air. This is talking about human spirit. We all have a human spirit. That's where he lives in us. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. Uh, he, he's saying each spirit is about something. You, in other words, you are either in Adam or you're in Christ. That, I mean, that's it. John is saying to test the spirits to where they're from because there's many false prophets out there in, in the world. And if we, you know, what's, what's John talking about? When he's talking about these false prophets, I know there's a lot of false prophets today, but let's go in context of the letter here that John's talking about. 2,000 years ago, what kind of false prophets was out there? Well, in verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God, and every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And we say, well, of course Jesus came in the flesh, and we've always believed that. So why is it such a big deal? Why is John making such a big deal? Remember what John is attacking. Remember the, the heresy that's coming to the church that Jesus wasn't really real. That he didn't come in the flesh. He was, he was spirit only. And I'm, uh, that, that was a popular Gnostic heresy at the time. John's fighting against that. And, you know, he says in the first chapter uh, of who we have seen, we've heard, our hands have handled. John was the one who said he, the word became flesh and was manifested or dwelt among us. And there's a lot of that uh, same, uh, you know, heresy a lot of times will be broken into many pieces and rear its head in other little forms. And, and you know, that I think it was a back who said that he can't look at sin and you know, we, we go through all that and then it becomes a doctrine and, oh, God is too holy, he can't look at sin, but yet he became sin. Then he just closed his eyes and, you know, that was Habakkuk who said that, not God. He really came in the flesh and he dwelt among us and John said we handled him and he's fighting against that heresy who said, no, God didn't really come in the flesh. I mean, it was just a spirit. He's got to be hands off of us. He can't really join us and you know I don't John is saying here you're, you're not from God if you're claiming that John so test the spirits to see whether they're where they're from you know are they born of God or are they uh, still over in Adam and I don't want you to think of this as a, as, as a class session on doctrine on right and wrong and all of that but think about why God cares about this issue so much. I mean, John has went over and over this issue. Why, why does God care? We say, well, we believe he came in the flesh. 
But it's through the incarnation of, of Jesus Christ, what God is announcing is this. God is saying to us, my, div my divinity is compatible with your humanity. Now think about that. My divinity is compatible with your humanity. I can come and, and I can dwell among you. I can demonstrate that I'm with you. He did that in, in his person. And, and he said, so that one day that I could come and dwell in you. I am compatible with your humanity. I'm compatible. That's why John is having none of this. And, you know, some people, they, they come along and they said, yeah, well, Jesus was with us a while. He appeared many times. He did many miracles. But he was spirit only. And, and what you end up with there is a far off distant God who is over there, who has nothing to do with you, can't be compatible with us. I, I know I was, uh, there, there are people out there who, who they say, well, Jesus came in the flesh, but man, he dropped that stuff off at his resurrection and got rid of it real quick because he don't, he don't like these bodies and he's, you know, he's not really compatible with us. And that's part of the Gnosticism heresy that, that's still there. So John is saying, you can try the spirits and see where they're from, whether they're of God or not. You know, some say, well, he, he just appeared. He looked like a human, but he really wasn't a person. You know, all, all through Scripture, he was tempted in all points, made like unto us. John is fighting that heresy and says that stuff, that junk is not from God. And he goes on to tell us what it is, verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you've heard that it was coming, and now it is already in the world. Boy, when you read that, most people say spirit of Antichrist, spirit of Antichrist. They don't read that, and now... John wrote this 2,000 years ago and now is already in the world. You, you mentioned the word Antichrist and what comes to most people's mind is the Left Behind series, End Times, Revelation, Apocalypse, Antichrist, one dude, he's got this super master plan, he's going to trick everybody and The context here is the spirit of Antichrist, the, the anti-Jesus, in place of Jesus. And this, and this is against the message that Jesus came in the flesh. John says, you heard about this. You heard it was coming. I told you it was coming. And here it is. Watch out for it. I told you guys. Watch out for it. Verse 4. <coughs> You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, boy, here comes this spiritual warfare. And, and I've, I've said this before. Uh, I'll just interject this part here. It talks about spiritual, uh, you know, take the armor of God and stand. But if you look at that word, it, it's it's uh, Penelope, P-A-N-O-P-L-Y, ever how you say that. But it has to do with the dress uniform. Tim can tell you, he's an old military guy. Uh, I think about TV uh, or, or watching a Marine commercial. And here's the Marines, and they're, they're dress blues, and they've got a sword. Marines don't fight in dress blues. That's a... Uh, parade uniform. It's, we've already got the victory. And look at all the medals up here to show you the victory. And I've got the sword. I don't fight with that sword. It'd be, Marines would be crazy to go to war in that uniform. The warfare is over. You know, speak comfortably to, to my people. Tell her her warfare has been accomplished. We stand. Having done all, didn't say having done all fight. Having done all stand. So 
people, you know, uh, spiritual warfare, and I know they want to go casting out demons and devils and fighting demons and devils, and boy, you see a whole lot of that in churches. And You know, i got to ask the question, is it possible for Christians to uh, need to cast out demons out of other Christians? Well, this passage right here explains this. It, it explains it itself. It gives us some insight. It says... Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So where is the enemy located? Not in you. Not in the church. The enemy is located in the world. So, And who is in you? Christ in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. And you know, I've said this before. Christ Jesus does not share our human spirit with anybody else. He comes to live inside of us, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. You know what sealed is? I mean, it's nothing else that's getting in there, closed off. You're his, bought with a price. He's not sharing. You belong to him. You know, we had a while that was in the church, and then all of a sudden a demon got in him. It's impossible. There's no even Bible for that. The, the, the evil one lives in those in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You won't find a single verse in, in the New Testament epistles about Christians needing to cast demons out of other Christians. It is plainly just not there. Again, why is that so? Why don't we need to cast demons out of other Christians? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, we can be afflicted. We can have all kinds of condemning thoughts. We can fight with error. If we're fighting with error, what's the solution? Truth. I mean, this is about relationship with God. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Verse 5, they are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You see, here he is again. He's saying, remember earlier in the letter, there's light and there's darkness. There's love and there's hate. There's lost and there's, there's saved. Now it's truth and error. He's always making that contrasting uh, point here. And he's saying that those who, uh, there are those who listen and there are those who don't listen. There are those who, are, those who listen are of God. Those who don't listen are not of God. There's no gray area here. I always, you, you know, I did used to wonder about gray areas because we just kind of have, this is where secular, uh, secularism, if I'm saying that right, comes into play. Because we think there's three kinds of walk with God. There's a walk in the spirit, there's a walk in the flesh, and then there's the other stuff. You know, that God's really not involved in the everyday stuff. God's not involved. But God sees it as black and white. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that God hasn't created our emotions and our emotions enjoy all kinds of different things and there's highs and there's lows. And, uh, but when it comes to the gospel message, when it comes to our forgiveness, it's black and white. You've been forgiven. That's it. There's no gray area. When it comes to our relationship with the law, we're not under the law. I, there's no middle ground here. When it, when it comes to our being a new creation in Christ Jesus, th that's it. There's not a, almost new or one of these days be new or we're working on being. That, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. No, no gray area here. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Well, here we go again. I know a lot of people that they want nothing to do with Jesus, but they do a lot of, uh, lot of really nice things. We would call them loving good people. We would say they're good people. And, you know, I'd rather be around those kind of people than evil 
being obnoxious people. But what is God really saying here? And I, and I think we miss it. We, we say, okay, we got saved. Now it's time for principles. Okay, you know, you got saved, and now we gotta we gotta get on with the with 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 doing stuff. You know, I hear this all the time. We gotta start serving God. We got we gotta start doing stuff. Well, that's not the case because lost people can do a lot of good stuff too. You know? They don't want nothing to do with Jesus, but they do a lot of good stuff. Uh, lost people can have morals. Lost people can be ethical. But what the gospel is saying here is when we open the door of our heart and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our life, then our, our job every day is, is to wake up every morning and let him be life in us because we're born of him. If you're going to try and imitate Jesus, you know, what would Jesus do? He's a tough act to follow. One moment he's calling the Pharisees vipers. Next minute he's in the temple flipping tables over, running them out with a whip. Next minute he's walking on water. Then the next second he's being gracious and kind and forgiving to prostitutes and, and he's having dinner with tax collectors. I mean, what do you do with all that? When, when do, how do I know when to be nice? How do I know when to call a spade a spade? How do I know when I'm supposed to flip tables over? How do I know when I'm supposed to go walk on the water? You were coming to church and I always ask, you got to be serving God. I said, man, you got to give me a list. I mean, <laughs> what are we supposed to be doing here? And, and what, if, if Christians are called to do anything, they're called to rest. Man, that just don't sound right. I mean, but I can show you where it says rest. It means you cease from your labors. We're called to rest. But what if there's really no supposed to do list? What if there's just a person? A life. A life that we're called to depend on and live from. See, we live from him, not for him. Boy, that is huge difference. We live from him, not for him. And, you know, the scriptures tells us many ways what he's all about. And, but we can either go about imitating the historical Jesus or we can go about living from the resurrected ascended Christ who lives in you so it is not what would Jesus do but what is Christ doing in and through me now today in this very moment that's what it means to walk by the spirit we live from him anybody can imitate a historical teacher and in fact, that's what the other religions of the world do. The, the Buddhists and the, the Bahara and the Hare Krishnas and all them try to imitate their historical teacher because you know what? He's dead. <laughs> we don't have a dead teacher. We have a living one who resurrected and ascended and now lives in us. And what sets Christianity apart is that we are actually claiming that within our earthen vessel, this, this body of flesh, in that place that we call our spirit, our teacher lives there. Our teacher lives inside of us. That's at the core of Christianity. And Paul says, you know, if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. Because there's, if there's no resurrection, we're still dead in our sins. I, you know, I wish people could get a hold of that. If Christ be not risen, you are still dead and in your sins. Which means if he has risen, you are not dead and your sin is gone. We're alive because he lives in us. 
He is our life. So it's not principles. It's a person. That, that's what it means that we're born of God. That's what it means when we, when we love that we're living from love himself. Anybody can put a smile on. Fake it till you make it, they say. But to be motivated by the heart of God, that's what he's interested in. You know, works in us both to, both to do, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That means he motivates us. And you know, when you're motivated, nobody has to make you do it. You want to do it. You're motivated to do it. Let me keep on reading here. Verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. This is what we've been saying, that we might live through him. Remember Jesus said, I come that you might have life. People quote that verse all the time. And I think they miss it. I know I've missed it for years and years. And they think that life means you got forgiveness of sins. And, you know, forgiveness of sins is quite awesome. But that's only half the picture. He didn't just forgive, your, forgive us of our sins and then fly back off to planet heaven. I come that you might have life. That we might live. You see, he didn't say here, I come that you might have principles to live by. He didn't come to give us a holy book so that we could basic instructions, principle to live by before leaving earth. Give us some principles to live by, but a person that we might live by him and through him. Now, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We talked about this word before, propitiation. That means, propitiate means to satisfy, to satisfy completely. So, God has been satisfied completely with the sacrifice of his son. The work of Jesus Christ was enough. And sadly, in the church today, most don't believe that. They may say they believe it, but they don't really believe it. Now, you can check this out. I found this today. Uh, it's, it's nine years old. I don't know if it's still out there or not, but 2011, they made a phone. You know, an app for your phone that you can, uh, an app that you get, you get on your phone or your iPad. And this app is called the Sin Tracker. Have you ever heard of Sin Tracker? And, and they advertise it as, can your iPhone bring you closer to God? And in the advertisement it says, it aims to help Roman Catholics who haven't been to the confessional booth in a while keep track of their sins one commandment at a time. What in the world is going on? You know, first John one night, we confess our sins, and now here we go down this road again. Well, I mean, we need an electronic device now to keep track of all my sins so that I can confess them and so that I can come to a place of being right with God. You know, I was right with God, and then I fell out of fellowship because I did something. Now I gotta, have I got this app and this app keeps track of all my sins and I can confess them and I can get into this place? Well, if I know most people, you know, when you're filling out all the little things on your phone and it's asking you all these questions, we don't ever tell the truth on them things. We lie through half of them. So now this thing's going to probably think you're a really good person and you don't have much sin. Well, and, you know, what happens if I don't answer the questions right on the app? What if I just 
make a mistake and I forget one, here's the worst case scenario. What if my daggone phone crashes? <laughs> you know, I was going to confess all my sins Sunday and uh, daggone phone crash Friday and man, I don't know now. See, that whole system and, and the system that's in, in most of the churches today is based on my memory, my phone, my confessing, my ability, which puts me at the dadgone center of the whole thing. I heard a guy say the other day, God has got a big book. He's writing down every sin you do in that book. And then the day of judgment, he's going to pull that book out, play a big movie screen, and all your sin will be played before you in the whole world and you'll be embarrassed and ashamed. You don't know if you'll make it in or not. Now we're talking to believers. The scripture says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting their trespasses against them, not imputing their iniquities, not counting their... God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting their trespasses against him. I mean, that kind of throws the big book theory out the window. Your sin and iniquity, I will remember no more until judgment day. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. I will re That's new covenant. Now, here's one thing. Again, I wish... American church would get this. The Jews, I got to give them credit right here. They understood this. The Jewish system of forgiveness of sin wasn't a, a confession or a verbal apology. God, I'm sorry. None of that brought about cleansing. What was it in the Jewish system that brought about cleansing? None other than a blood sacrifice. Something had to die. Blood had to be spilled. Blood had to be offered. But you know what? That temple is gone. There is no more Jewish temple. The altar is gone. They tore it all down. Not one stone left on another. So the Jews stopped offering sacrifices. And, and they wait for a day until they can get a new temple built. Build them a new altar and start again with offering blood sacrifices. But for now they stop because they understood God's economy. God's economy is blood. That's it. It's a blood economy. Only blood, not phone apps, not made up altars in front of churches. And I, I, I kind of get appalled when, when Christians want to send money over there so that they can rebuild a temple and rebuild an altar and get a red heifer. They never even offered a red heifer up there. Um, but I'm thinking, was Jesus not enough? Then we got to rebuild a temple and start offering stuff again. I mean, a nasty old sheep, a nasty old goat is better than the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And then the churches here try to reinstitute, try to make up their own altar system. And you guys know, I, I, I talk about it all the time. There'll be a bunch of people hovering around up in front of the steps tonight, <coughs> calling it some altar. There's no more altars. If the cross didn't forgive you once and for all, we're, we're done for. There, there's nothing I can do to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, nothing. Only the blood of Jesus brings forgiveness. Now, why is this such a big deal? The iPhone or not, temple or not, altar or not, the point is, have your sins been dealt with? I mean, that's a question we got to ask. Have your sins been dealt with? And when were they dealt with? How well were they dealt with? Is it really true what Jesus said? It is finished. I mean, let me read that verse again. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. He showed that love. I'm adding right here. He showed that love because he sent his son to be the, the satisfaction, the propitiation for our sins. Jesus, the, the one time, once for all, satisfaction so that God is no longer 
doing anything in retribution for our sins. I didn't say our sin didn't have consequences. Yes, our sin has consequences. Go speed and cheat on your wife. They have consequences. But God is not doing anything in retribution to our sins because they've been paid for. They've been dealt with. And what could God do in retribution for our sin anyway? There's only one thing he could do. Kill us. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And I wish people could get that when they come up there and say, if Jesus didn't forgive you of your sins and you come up front and lay in front of the church floor, what we need is a priest with a knife. And we say, well, if Jesus didn't do it, the only other thing is I can do here is cut your throat. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So if we really want to get down to it, that's what we're going to have to do. But do you realize that Paul said, you know what? We were crucified with Christ. He died. We, and what happened? We died with him. We were, we were buried, placed into his death. And you know what? That's the satisfaction of God, the perpetuation of God. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. The only way that we have one ounce of real love that doesn't burn out and fade away and it ain't about gritting your teeth and trying your hardest, trying your best. The only way that we have one ounce of real love in us is when we possess love. And I say we possess love now. Think about what I'm going to say here. We, when we possess love, we possess God. Now you say, well, no. what do you mean we possess God? Well, he says, I will be your God. When he says, I will be your God, he's saying, you will possess me. And then he says, you will be my people and I will possess you. It, it's the same thing that, that Jesus said, in that day you'll know I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. You're in me, and I'm in you. You'll possess me, and I'll possess you. You remember, he's compatible with our humanity. By this, verse 13, by this we know that we, are, we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. There are some basic, I guess, minimum understanding of what it means to be a Christian. I'm talking understanding here. Now, I know some struggle with, with salvation. Uh, the enemy's good at his job. We, we, we say, am I really saved? You know, have you ever had those thoughts before? Am I really saved? Was my baptism really good enough? To, was I baptized in the right name? Because we're so used. We, we, we say, I, I, I'm not saved because I don't feel saved. I got to feel it. You know, I grew up, it was better felt than tell. That's what they used to say. I got to feel it. Now, what John is saying here is, if you believe that Jesus Christ came to the flesh, that his flesh was nailed to a cross for your sins, and you believe that he was the Son of God, and you, you've opened the door of your heart, and you've received him, then he gives you the 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 right to be called children of God, sons of God. Gives you that right. And you know what? It's not a feeling. It ain't based on a feeling. Never has been based on a feeling. If it was based on a feeling, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't need any of this. We'll just go around and seek feelings out. See, that's what, that's what they try to get with, with the altar calls. You know what an altar call is. We're trying to get a feeling. 
We're trying to get an emotional response. And those same people come up every day and week anyway because they want an emotional response. You know, people, they go be baptized and they, they get a feeling and they, they, they want it again. And, they, you know, they, they go back. Well, how about this? I don't feel like George Washington was the first president of the United States. Do you ever feel like George Washington was the president of the United States? How do you know George Washington was the first president of the United States? Do you feel it? No. You don't feel it. I read that he was. So it's not a feeling. It's about knowing. Knowing. And what does he say in verse 16? We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. You see, I, we didn't even know it was there, but there it was, love, there it was. We've come to know and believe. We didn't come to feel it. We came to know, and we came to believe. It got nothing to do with feeling. Some days you might feel real safe. Some days you might not. God's love, I, I think we did a lesson about how, we do it, how to experience the love of God. And we think, oh, you know, I heard some people talking this weekend, wow, if we go into church and we get our praise right and we get our worship right, then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is going to fall out of the sky and fall right in this place and God is going to start moving. We got to do our job first. And all these things we're reading, he showed his love because he first loved us. He did this. He sent his son. And, and John says, that by this, we, we know and we believe. But he didn't say nothing about failing. He said, we know and believe because God did this. And we know it and we believe he said, uh, he did what he said. God's love is experienced through knowing what Jesus accomplished. That's why again and again we go back to the cross. How many times do you have to go visit the cross? I do all the time. I mean, I sin, I mess up, and you know, you can start feeling bad. The enemy's there in your ear. Boy, look at you. You're supposed to be something big. Now look what, I got to go back to that cross and say, yeah, boy, hang on there a minute. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. And then, then I go back and, I, and he says, well, you're dead. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, let me go look at that tomb right there. They found not the body of Jesus. He got up. And it was just, wait a minute, he's still ain't walking around. That same Jesus ascended, sat down at the right hand of God and poured out the Holy Spirit. And now I know I, I have been crucified, I've been buried, I've been raised and seated with him in heavenly places. Do, do I feel that all the time? No, but I sure know it and I believe it. That's how we experience the love of God. We're raised and seated with Daddy. We came home. We're seated with Daddy. You know, sat right up in his lap. So for the little children to come unto me. Set him right in his lap, did We pull on Daddy's beard. Say, Daddy, what about this? Why'd you make a frog? Go ask him. You can. You got that right. It's, it's from that knowing that that believing that would ever experience any sense of closeness to God. Verse 17. By this, what we just said, love is perfected. By this, love is perfected. Perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Part of, of 1 John, the message was that being a child of God was not just getting a new name. He didn't just call us sons of God. You know, I'm going to give you a title or a tattoo. He's not pretending. But that God really gave us a new nature. We're really born of incorruptible seed. We're, he really lives in us. And there's a confidence, a confidence here. And then he says this confidence, not just now, but in the day of judgment. I would love to spend a long time on this day of judgment right here, but to take it where most Christians take it, uh, 
you know, they go all the way to the end with it, day of judgment, and all of a sudden now he's going to get that big book out again. That big book about where he's been writing sins, but I just showed you. He, he's not keeping track of sins, but because their love has not been perfected, they think <coughs> they don't have any confidence. Don't have any confidence. But he says, uh, we have confidence. Why do we have confidence? Because as he is, so are we. Now, what's he talking about, as he is? That means Jesus is okay with God. And that means just to the same degree that Jesus is okay with God, you are okay with God. So much Paul says that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, we're okay with it. He likes us. He loves us. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears is not protect, not perfected in love. See, perfect love casts out fear. Now, a minute ago, we're talking about confidence. Love is perfected. But now we're over here with no confidence. I'm in fear because of punishment. And now, why would I be in fear because of, of, of punishment? Because I think I'm going to be punished for my sins. Because God's got the big book up there and he's keeping track and writing down every bad thought that you have. Fear involves punishment. But yet these same people who have this fear say, Jesus paid for all my sins. You know, boy, we go back to Isaiah 53. He bore our griefs and our sorrows and the iniquity of us all was laid on him and the, the punishment of every sin was laid on Jesus. That's why he was crucified. He was punished for my sins. And then we run around believing that later on, somehow, God was still up there keeping track. And somehow, some way, I have to pay for my sin. Well, we can go right back to where we were to start with. There's only one way to pay for your sin. The remission uh, of blood is the only remission of sin, the shedding of blood. Well, I thought we had to go to hell. And, and punish forever. He didn't say that. You want to you want to be uh, you want to atone for your sins, and you got to die. I mean, that's you, you understand. Or so people don't think it out. They don't. They don't think. They don't. They don't know. They don't really believe because they live in fear. Fear of punishment. They say, well. You know, this is what we had. We had the debit card theology. You know, pay as you go. That's crazy. Uh, I thought Jesus paid it all. And you know what the payment was for sin? Death. He died on the cross for the real Jesus, born of a woman, died on the cross. But we have this yeah, but theology. And John won't have it here. John will not have the yeah, but theology. I mean, you can believe anything you want, but you'll, you'll have to believe it apart from the Word of God. You know what I mean? You can believe anything you want, but you'll have to throw this out. Because the Word of, uh, the word of God says, perfect love casts out fear. And I've talked about this before. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, this may be a terrible analogy, but go back to a bar room, and in, and in here you got some drunk in there, and he's causing a bunch of trouble, and the big bouncer comes, grabs him by the, by the collar and by the seat of his britches, and goes to the door and throws him out on his head. Perfect love grabs fear by the collar and by the shirt tail and by the seat of his britches and walks to the door and violently casts it out. That's what perfect love does. Perfect love casts out fear. Because that, that fear involves, yeah, but, what about? Perfect love says, no. The, the one who fears is not perfected in love. How amazing. The one who fears is not perfected in love. And I said, this, this ain't got nothing to do with the feeling. We know and we believe it's because they ain't been taught about the once and for all 
sacrifice, shedding of his own precious blood, the finished work of Jesus Christ, so they still live in fear. That's why they come crawling up front every week, because they don't feel like, as he is, so are we in the world. I got to do something to get myself back right with God, because they live in fear. So I understand why they do it, but they don't need to do it, but they ain't been taught. You're okay with God. But they still live in fear. What's the answer? Perfect love. And where is perfect love going to take me? Always back to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not feelings. I can't sprinkle magic dust on you. I'm going to have to go right back and say, we got to go back to that cross. Paul said, you know what? I'm determined to know nothing among you. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, we, we got to get that settled. We got to get... And what is that? That's where God demonstrated his perfect love for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't we hollered out, hey, we wasn't even looking for him. We've all went astray. Everybody, and yet, he did it. And that's what John says, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. I mean, there it is. John is bringing us to a place of no bragging here. You know, people say, well, you wouldn't believe what I do for the Lord, what I've done for the Lord. I called on the Lord and he answered and I sought him out and I seek him every day. John says, none of that bragging. <laughs> Get that junk out of here. He's bringing us to a place of humility. The only reason we love God is because God started it. He initiated it. And he dwells in us and God is love. Again, even while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. I mean, he's the one who brought about any response of love. God himself did it. Verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Boy, John don't mince words here, does he? He just calls it like it is. John, the apostle of love, you could have used a nicer word. He says, he says, if somebody says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. I can just, you know, you got to say it with the country, twang, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Remember the last chapter we were talking about keep his commandments and how people get scared. They think it's the 613. They think it's the 10. We saw what it was. Believe Jesus. Love, and here it is again, another clarification. Love God, love other people. I mean, it's all fulfilled in this love, and guess what? He is love, and he's in you, so how do we fulfill this? We live from him, who is love. Not for him, we live from him, who is love. And in doing that, we'll be motivated naturally to love our brother. Any other way, he's a liar, is what John said, he's a liar. It's about love, and it's about love. And to sum it all up, it's about love. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it's about, isn't it? Love. So, conclusion, we, we are from God, born of the Spirit. It's not just a name, it's, it's a reality. We are designed to love. We've been made compatible with who he is, compatible means these two go together. They're compatible. That's we see a couple and we say they're compatible. They were made for each other. Do you realize that he made us to be compatible with him and him with us? John is not going to have any of this heresy nonsense that he what didn't come in here in the flesh and that he, he even raised in the flesh. We're designed to love and it's his love in us and perfect Love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. You remember the parable of the workers who, who come in the vineyard different hours of the day? Do you remember how that parable went? You know, the one who worked all day got a whole lot of money, and the one who will come in the middle of the day got less money than the one who came. That's not how the parable went, was it? They all got paid the same. Jesus is an equal employment, equal opportunity employer. They all got the same thing. Guess what? He, he's it. He's the pay 
payment. He's the reward. He himself. He's it. He's the promise. And then there's no punishment left for believers. He's the propitiation for our sins. No punishment left for believers. And the conclusion is this. He really, really, really loves us. That, I mean, that's, that's it. He really, really, really loves us. So I will, I will quit with that right there.